I will introduce the first speaker, and that is Danny Conrad, who is a grad student in the lab of Seth Gardner at UCSF. So Danny did his undergrad at UC Santa Barbara, uh, where he spent a lot of time in the lab of, uh, in, the, in the Rodman lab, working with T-Labs. Um, he also spent a semester in Auckland during that time, so that's very cool. Um, so he joined UCSF as a grad student in the TETRET program um, and joined the Gardner lab in 2018. So there he's worked on both method development for single cell omics and also uh, worked on how cancer genes affect uh, tissue structure. But today it's the single cell omics, the work that he will talk to us about. So please go ahead, Danny. All right, thank you, Hanukkah, for that nice introduction. That was my first time being introduced uh, before a talk. <laughs> um, so yeah, today I'm gonna be presenting uh, work that I've been doing over the last year or so. Um, including, you know, the time during the pandemic, uh, on sample multiplexing in single cell epigenomics. So um, you all probably need less of an introduction to this subject matter than when I gave this talk to my graduate program last week, but I know this community spans scientists at all career stages, so here goes nothing. Um, every human cell contains over 200 centimeters of genomic DNA that is tightly wrapped, wound, and organized inside a nucleus that's only six microns in diameter. This organization serves not just to neatly package the DNA, but not unsurprisingly, it has evolved as a dynamic and configurable system by which cells can regulate how, when, and where genes get expressed. Now, there are countless distinct molecular mechanisms that control this organization at every length scale from nucleosome positioning to the 3D partitioning of chromatin with inside, it's, it, sorry, inside of the nucleus. Uh, but still, a basic view of a cell's chromatin landscape can be achieved by profiling what regions of the genome are just accessible or open. So various techniques have been developed over the years to accomplish this, but the most widely used is a taxic. So here you flood nuclei from your cells or tissue of interest with a transposase enzyme that is loaded with sequencing adapters. The enzyme binds DNA wherever it can reach it, at which point the double helix is broken and adapters are ligated in. A few simple library steps later and you have a finished ataxic library. The sensitivity of this assay means that it can be performed with relatively little starting material or even single cells. So one of my favorite aspects of this technique is the characteristic fragment length distribution that you get as a result of the enzyme more easily cutting DNA between nucleosomes instead of just the DNA, or instead of the DNA wrapped around a histone octamer. When you map the sequence fragment library to a reference genome, uh, this allows you to identify where the most frequent cut sites are, which are interpreted as the most accessible chromatin regions or peaks. Open chromatin peaks can be used to infer gene expression as they've been demonstrated to correlate very well. Uh, but the precise genomic sequence and location of peaks enables new types of analyses that can't be achieved from transcriptomic measurements alone. Uh, attack peaks can, be help used, can help identify new cell states or clusters that are indistinguishable by, by RNA-seq or that precede transcriptional changes. Motif analysis of differentially accessible peaks can identify transcription factors that may be driving gene expression differences. And finally, coaccessibility analysis of gene body and intergenic peaks can allow discovery of functional gene enhancers. So the commercialization of single cell attack seek has enabled scientists to perform these kinds of analyses with single cell resolution to capture and quantitatively measure the spectrum of chromatin states within heterogeneous systems. So tissues such as the gut could be spatially sectioned into distinct regions in order to determine how the chromatin states of the epithelial and mesocomal cell types differ along its length with mesoscale spatial resolution, both during adulthood and development. Time courses of stem cell differentiation protocols could be performed to track the chromatin landscape changes going on as cells respond to growth factor stimulation. And additionally, many epigenetic inhibitors are in clinical trials right now for treatment of very, a variety of different cancers. High throughput sequencing of cells, organoids, and tissues dosed with these and more novel drug candidates could lead to new insights into their safety, specificity, and mechanism of action. However, while all of these kinds of experiments are currently possible, there are still serious hurdles to their execution. The 10X Genomics Chromium is the most widely used platform for this and other single cell assays. Each chip features eight microfluidics lanes where the user can sequence up to eight unique samples in parallel, recovering up to around 10,000 cells per lane. Each of these lanes costs $1,250 in reagents alone, which means that the processing of just 16 unique samples would cost $20,000, and that's before sequencing. This means the system is great for high cell throughput, but not ideal for experiments that require high sample throughput. And this can make the types of mechanistic studies I just mentioned prohibitively expensive unless you really, really wanna know the answer to your question. 
Second, because each sample is processed on a separate microfluidic lane, experiments with large numbers of samples will have to use a correspondingly large number of individual lanes spread across distinct chips and potentially even processed on separate days. This sort of design welcomes any number of technical batch effects that must be removed computationally, which is never as clean as just minimizing batch effects to begin with. To address these concerns and make experiments I wanted to run for other projects more feasible, I set out to develop a sample multiplexing method for single cell attack seek and make mechanistic high sample throughput experiments a more reasonable undertaking. So we in our lab and others have previously developed techniques designed to enable multiplexing of single cell RNA sequencing experiments. And thankfully the technology we used in our multi-seq method could be readily adapted to this new modality. So uh, I just want to say from the start that this is work that I've done with my uh, lab mate and co-author, Chris McGinnis, who is also one of the uh, authors on the multi-seq paper. Um, so our prior multiplexing technique makes use of lipid modified oligonucleotides or LMOs for short. These are a two component system that performs that partitions stably into cell membranes with a single stranded overhang that allows us to hybridize a third sample specific barcode oligo to each set of nuclei or cells. Adapting this method for single cell attack seek required a bit of a redesign of the barcode oligos and adjustments to the library preparation protocol, but we managed to work those work out the kinks after a few sort of catastrophic failures early on. So in our pilot experiment, we set out to validate the method in a variety of ways. Uh, we wanted to ensure that we could accurately classify cells for which we use three genotypically distinct donor samples. We wanted to ensure that our labeling procedure does not impact data quality for which we included labeled and unlabeled nuclei. And that our workflow is amenable to third party tagmentation reagents for which we tagmented a sample with Illumina's TN5 kit. Um, and so, you know, you go through the rest of the, uh, the gem emulsion step and then the library prep protocol uh, steps and you end up with two distinct libraries, one that has your attack fragments and one that has your barcode fragments. Uh, and then uh, you can see the bioanalyzer traces of these distinct libraries here. So we have the barcode fragments as one distinct peak and then the attack fragments as that classic periodic, periodic distribution of fragment sizes. <laughs> And so as we expected, sample barcoding does not exhibit any kind of significant effect on downstream data quality as seen by the even distribution of the red and black samples in this UMAP. However, using different tagmentations had a noticeable, different tagmentation reagents had a noticeable effect. Illumina tagmented nuclei clustered slightly separately from the 10X tagmented nuclei. And they also exhibited higher transcription start site enrichment and a fragment length distribution that was more skewed towards smaller fragments. These are actually well-documented batch effects that are expected to result from higher concentrations of TN5 enzyme. And in fact, the T cell populations in our UMAP seem to be better defined in the Illumina sample. So we actually see this as an improvement over the other two libraries. And this is important to demonstrate because currently samples still need to be tagmented in separate reactions. And 10X Genomics only supplies enough tagmentation reagents with their kit to match the number of lanes purchased. So tagmentation mix quickly runs out if you multiplex many samples. Sourcing tagmentation reagents elsewhere, either from other vendors or by producing yourself, alleviates this bottleneck. So we additionally had to establish our labeling and classification of efficacy with this pilot. Uh, this barcode plot on the left demonstrates robust labeling of transposed nucle nuclei with singlet nuclei collapsed on the axes and doublets, which are technical artifacts where two or more nuclei are co-encapsulated, uh, sparsely populate the center. Because we use three distinct PBMC donors, we could also use in silico genotype demultiplexing tools like Vireo to validate that our barcodes are allowing us to accurately classify the cell's sample of origin. In the right two plots, you can see near perfect uh, correspondence between these two orthogonal demultiplexing methods, giving us confidence in the method when we apply it to genotypically indistinguishable samples. <laughs> So as with multi-seq, and just as you saw in the barcode plot on the last side, the addition of sample of origin barcodes adds another layer of information that can be used to identify and remove doublets from the data. Existing techniques for single cell attack seq depend on computationally inferring doublet identity by comparing all cells to a set of simulated doublets. While this is okay on its own, it struggles to identify doublets formed from similar cells and requires the user to manually set a limit on the number of expected doublets. Multi-attack allows us to identify a greater fraction of doublets with greater confidence by filtering nuclei that are positive for more than one sample barcode. So shown here, sample barcoding increases the number and diversity of doublets identified in this preliminary experiment, including many homotypic doublets hiding within uh, the homo 
TIVIC cell type clusters, such as the T cell population here. So as a representative demonstration of this technique, uh, we designed an experiment where we treated PBMCs from a single donor with varying concentrations of two epigenetic inhibitor drugs, GSK-126 and Saha or Varinostat, and also stimulated the PBMCs with CD3, CD28 tetrameric antibodies, which mimics in vivo activation of resting T cells and stimulates a cascade effects of effects on other cells in the mixture. So we ended up with 14 samples total. Within the results of even this modest experiment, we can quickly see the benefits of increasing sample throughput. The additional sample specific metadata we gain from the distinct conditions, such as dose, drug type, activation state, uh, coupled with the diversity of cell types inherent to the biological material we used, gives us myriad new ways to carve up the data and gain new insights from these new analyses. A larger scale experiment could include additional replicates, donors, and even time points. So just as an, uh, as an example, uh, here I perform analysis comparing just the stimulated versus resting monocyte populations. Uh, when PBMCs are stimulated, monocytes undergo differentiation to macrophages as part of the immune response. Motif analysis of the stimulated monocytes indeed shows increased accessibility of motifs recognized by the transcription factor MITF and MAFB, among others, which are known regulators of macrophage differentiation. So on the left, we're seeing computed gene activity scores, and on the right, we're seeing uh, peak accessibility, uh, uh, a heat map of peak of differential peaks. Oh yeah, so here's the motif and uh, enrichment plot. So when I look at the inhibitor specific data, Saha, which is a pan HDAC inhibitor, had a comic had a pretty much comically strong effect on these cells, as seen in this heat map depicting differential peak accessibility. Even when I analyze the response of all of the diverse cell types together in bulk, um, motif analysis here revealed really strong upregulation of CTCF and CTCFL motifs, which kind of struck me as odd. So. Looking at the motif enrichment scoring per cell, you can see that this increased motif ac accessibility is particularly high in the T cells and the B cells that got the highest SAW dose. Monocytes may have exhibited this effect as well, but there, doesn't see, there don't seem to be any monocytes from that particular drug condition, perhaps due to drug toxicity. Um, so in response, I did some Googling and found papers that implicate histone deacetylase activity in the repressive function of CTCF which very likely explains why CTCF motifs were so enriched when we use Saha to inhibit HDACs in these cells. So in conclusion, um, I've shown you that multi-attack main pending can successfully barcode and demultiplex pooled single cell attack seq samples. Uh, and this is compatible with non-10x tagmentation reagents, so either from other vendors or presumably homebrew as well, uh, to avoid reagent bottleneck. And multi sample multiplexing improves double detection within single cell attack seek uh, experiments. So ongoing work that we're, work that, that we're focused on right now um, is a, a fantastic postdoc in our lab has, is, has developed a method that we think will enable us to perform temperature stable barcoding uh, that will allow us to do pooled tagmentation. So this will result in a faster and easier workflow for increased sample throughput and will significantly reduce cost and batch effects from having to perform distinct tagmentation reactions. And we also, you know, once this is finished, I then want to take this method that we've now worked on and apply it to open biological questions in the lab, such as, as Hanukkah mentioned earlier, how oncogenes stimulate cell state changes at the earliest stages of breast cancer in the, in the mammary gland and affect tissue structure, and why hormone receptor positive mammary epithelial cells become less responsive to hormone receptor signaling after pregnancy. Uh, this is all work done by some of my fantastic lab mates that I then want to apply this to. And so with that, um, I'd like to acknowledge my awesome lab, uh, in particular, Chris and Brittany. Um, this picture is unfortunately not representative of us anymore. We've had quite a few new people join and a few people leave, but we haven't been able to do our usual uh, lab retreat this year due to the pandemic. So we'll have to get a new updated picture at some other point. Um, Eric Chow, who runs the Center for Advanced Technology at UCSF, has, is instrumental in all of the multi-seek slash multi-attack projects. Um, and then I'd also like to give a shout out to Jeffrey Granja, who is a graduate student in Bill Greenleaf's and a lab at Stanford, who let me um, sort of beta test his uh, Archer pipeline for doing single cell chromatin accessibility analysis. 
Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you for listening and I'll, I guess, open it up for questions. Awesome, thank you, Danny. That was a great talk. Um, okay, so just as a reminder, you can type your questions in a Q&A or you can raise your hand and I'll make sure to have the right windows open so I can see that. Um, yeah, so to start off, there's already a question that uh, was typed out by El Shaima Ali. Um, is the multi-attack seek using fresh cells or can it also use frozen cells is your question? Yeah, great question. Um, so uh, there's nothing in the multi-attack portion of the protocol that uh, restricts the, the use of nuclei from frozen samples. Um, we've certainly, I've certainly applied multi-seq, so the predecessor to multi-attack, uh, to nuclei isolated from frozen tissues with, with success. So um, while we haven't tried it ourselves yet, we're expecting that once we start kind of bringing this into the hands of other people that uh, it'll open up it'll be applied to a, a, a range of different types of samples. And certainly I think frozen samples, frozen cells and tissues will be, will be a, a, a viable option as long as people have a, a, a robust method for getting nuclei out of them. So basically the answer is if you can do single cell attack seek on those nuclei, you will likely be able to do multi-attack on them. So how far do you think, basically can you now with this new method basically push it with to as many samples as you can pay for in terms of sequencing, or is there still any inherent limit to number of samples? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I don't believe that there is necessarily a limit in the number of sample barcodes you can multiplex. It comes down to what is the diversity of your biological material that you're trying to measure. Um, are you trying to capture any rare cell types? Um, so it comes down to uh, restrictions in the number of cells that you'll end up recovering from a single or a nuclei that you'll recover from a single lane. Um, so while we have heard of people multiplexing for at least for multi-seq up to like 90 something different samples, um, you know, once you start reaching those regimes, the number of cells that you, or nuclei that you recover per sample becomes diminished. But certainly uh, in the dozens of samples is, is perfectly viable uh, within a single lane. And there's not anything necessarily inherent to the method that restricts how many barcodes you can use. Be cool. Up to a you know, reasonable amount. <laughs> um, then there was a question that Vlad Teif, uh, so one of our co-organizers was asking, and he's wondering about your CTCF result, whether you mm -hmm. look whether the CTCF motifs where you gain or lose accessibility, uh, whether they are at that boundaries or not. Whether they're at what boundaries? At that boundaries. So are they like the... Oh, um, yeah, I haven't looked at that yet at all, actually. That would, be, that would be good to know if those are the canonical CTCF bindings, like TAD boundaries or, uh, or something else. I'm not by any means a CTCF biologist, so like what I know about it is from stuff I've read or what I learned in my, in my graduate courses. Um, but if there are published, you know, high C data sets uh, that would, that at least for the, for PBMCs that could, that we could use the, the annotations of which we could use to compare where those, uh, where those CTCF motifs are, um, that would be very interesting actually. Yeah. The, that experiment we performed prior to shutdown and then most of the analysis was done during shutdown. And so as things have ramped back up, um, we haven't done any like follow-up experiments, of course, to validate some of those findings. But um, but if there's the published data that I could then compare that to, that would be really interesting to look at. But I have not yet. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Denny.